Hello friends, today let's talk about the factor causing limitation of joint mobility and methods of increasing joint mobility. Let's start with the introduction. Movement of a body segments take place as a muscles or external forces moves the bones. Bones move with the respect to each other at the connecting joints. When moving a segment through its range of motion, that is ROM, all structures in the regions are affected, that is muscles, joint surfaces, capsules, ligaments, fascia, vessels and nerves. The total range of motion around a joint is highly specified and varies from one joint to another. For example, hip, trunk, shoulder, etc. As well from one individual to the next. Range of motion activities are mostly described in terms of joint range and muscle range. Ranges of available joint motions are usually measured with a goniometer and recorded in degrees. Here comes with the definition of joint mobilization. The passive movement of joint over their entire range of motion, that is ROM, to expand the range of motion and eliminate restriction is known as joint mobilization. Joint mobilization are skilled hand movements intended to improve tissue extensibility, increase range of motion, induce relaxation, mobilize or manipulate soft tissue and joints, modulate pain and reduce soft tissue swelling, inflammation or restriction. The primary techniques includes are mobilization and manipulation of joints and associated soft tissues. Mobilizations are passive movements that are oscillatory or sustained stretch performed in such a manner that the patient can prevent the motion if so desired. These motions are performed anywhere within the available range of motion. Now next comes the factor affecting the limitation of joint mobility. There are many factors which affect the joint mobility such as pain, injury for example, ankle sprain, diseases for example, osteoarthritis, next is extra fats or abnormal body mass, body asymmetry, abnormal tissue extensibility for example, contracture of the bones, body temperature, age and gender. Next, here comes the principles of joint mobilization. First comes with the physiologic or accessory motions. Physiologic motion is the normal active motion that is available at any synovial joints. Another way to describe Physiologic motion is the motion that occurs in the corneal planes. Example includes flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. Extraordinary motions are movements that cannot be performed actively but can be performed passively. Examples are distraction, glide, spins, and rotation of the joints. Extraordinary motion must be present for full physiologic motion to be present. Next physiological effect is concave and convex relation of joints. All synovial joints have a concave convex relation. When the examiner is passively moving a joint, caution should be made to move the joint in a manner similar to how it moves when the joint is being actively moved by the person. Osteokinematics is defined by how the bone is being moved through space, that is flexion, abduction. Arthrokinematics is defined by how the joint surfaces are moving as the bones is being moved, that is rolling, sliding, spinning. When the joint surface is convex with respect to the other side of the joint, the articular surface moves in the opposite direction on the shaft of the bone. When the shoulder joint is being flex as in swing phase of gait. By moving the humerus on the scapula, 
the convex surface of the proximal humerus is sliding and spinning on the concave glenoid of the scapula. When the joint surface is concave, the articular surface moves in the same direction the shaft of the bone. When the distal radius is being moved on the sensory corpus, as in this stand space of gait, the concave surface of the radius is rolling and sliding on the convex proximal rows of the carpal bones. The manual therapists try to move joint surface physiologically to avoid injuries such as joint subluxation and sprains. Here next comes the methods of increasing joint mobility. There are three types of joint mobilization. First is the passive mobilization, the second one is the active mobilization and the third one is active assisted mobilization. First starting with the passive mobilization, it is the movement within the unrestricted range of motion for a segment that is produced entirely by an external force and there is no voluntary muscle contraction. There are five grades in this type of mobilization. First grade is to relieve pain, small amplitude at the beginning range of motion. The second grade is to relieve pain, large amplitude through mid range of motion. The third grade is to decrease joint stiffness, large amplitude from mid range to the domain limit of motion. And the fourth grade is to decrease joint stiffness, small amplitude at normal limit of motion. And the fifth grade is the manipulation, that is small amplitude beyond end range. Active mobilization. Movement within the unrestricted range of motion for a segment that is produced by an active contraction of the muscle crossing the joints. The third one is active assisted mobilization, a type of active mobilization in which assistance is provided by an outside force either manually or mechanically because the prime mover muscles need assistance to complete the motion. The next topic is how to choose the appropriate mobilization technique and grades. When range of motion is decreased because of pain, if the pain is treated, range of motion increases. First grade and second grade mobilization should be performed in the pain-free range for 30 seconds. Functions should be assessed after mobilization to determine whether any changes has been achieved. When range of motion is decreased because of stiffness, grade third and grade four mobilization should be performed in the direction of the stiffness for 60 seconds if possible. Functions should be assessed after mobilization to determine whether any changes has been achieved. If pain and stiffness are present, the therapist must decide what the primary problem is. Does the pain limit range of motion or does the stiffness cause the pain? The sequence of pain and resistance can contribute to the treatment plan. For example, if pain occurs before resistance, use technique to control the pain before progressing to the more aggressive treatment. If pain occurs with resistance, Mobilization may be used with caution. It is customary to treat the pain and then stiffness. However, if pain occurs after the resistance, vigorous mobilization may be used to treat the stiffness, followed by technique for pain. Now, here comes the yeah, two effects of joint mobilization. First is passive joint mobilization effect and second one is active or self-mobilization effect. Passive joint mobilization effect, it maintains joints and soft tissue integrity. It minimizes the effects of the formation of contracture. It maintains mechanical elasticity of the muscles. It assists circulation and vascular dynamics. It enhances sustainable movements for cartilage nutrition and diffusion of material in the joints, it decreases or inhibits pain, active or cell mobilization effects. It maintains physiological elasticity and contractility of the participating muscles. It provides sensory feedbacks from the contracting muscles. 
It provides a stimulus for bones and joint tissue integrity. It increases circulation and prevents thrombus formation. It develops coordination and motor skill for functional activities. Next comes the, the precaution and contraindication of joint mobilization. Although both passive and active mobilization are contraindicated under any circumstance when motion to a part is disruptive to the healing process, but complete immobility leads to adhesion and contracture formation, sluggish circulation and prolonged recovery time. Mobilization has been contraindicated immediately following acute tears, fractures and surgeries. But because of benefits of controlled mobilization is used as long as the person tolerance is monitored. Some of the contraindications can be mentioned as first fractures, second ligament ruptures, third herniated discs with nerve compression in spinal mobilization. Fourth one is joint effusion. The fifth one is joint replacement. Sixth one is hypermobile joints. Seventh one is inability to relax. The next topic is limitations of mobilization techniques. Passive mobilization will not prevent muscle atrophy. It will not increase strength or endurance. It will not assist circulates to the extent that achieve or voluntary muscle contraction does. The next is active mobilization. For strong muscles, it will not maintain or increase strength. It will not develop skills or coordinations except in the movement pattern used. The next topic is procedure for applying mobilization technique. Based on the evaluation of the patient's impairment and levels of function, determine whether passive, active passive or active mobilization will meet the goal. Place the patient in a comfortable position that will allow the segment through the available range of motion. Be sure the patient has proper body alignment. Free the joint from restrictive clothing, linen, splint and dressings. The therapies should be positioned so that proper mechanics can be used. To control movement, grasp the extremity around the position. If the joints are painful, modify the grip, still providing support necessary for control. Support area of poor structural integrity, such as hypermobile joint, recent fracture sites, or paralyzed limb segments. Move the segment through its complete pain-free range. Do not force beyond available range. If the force is applied, it becomes stretch. Perform the motion smoothly and rhythmically, 5 to 10 repetitions. The number of repetitions depends on the objective of the program and the patient's condition and response to the treatment. If the plan of care includes specific mobilization, then first, no active resistance or assistance is given by the patient's muscle crossing the joints. If so, it becomes an active exercise. Second, the motion is carried out within free range of motion that is the range is available without force motion or pain. If the plan of care is the use of active assisted or active mobilization, first, demonstrate to the patient the motion desiring using passive range of motion, then ask the patient to perform the motion. Second, assistance is given only as needed for smooth motions when there is weakness assistance may be required only at the beginning or end of the motion. Monitor the patient's general condition during and after the procedure. 
Note any changes in vital signs, any change in warmth and color of the segments, and any change in the range of motion, pain, or quality of movements. Document observable and measurable reaction to the treatment. Modify or progress the treatment as necessary. Next comes the side effect of mobilization technique. Mobilization and manipulation are generally very safe. Side effects are very rare. The patient will be fully screened for any contraindication before undergoing treatment. During treatment, we need to be aware that in a small number of patients, first, local discomfort and post-treatment soreness occurs. This should last no longer than a couple of days at most. Lightheadedness occasionally occurs in patients who receive neck manipulation. Third, pain during treatment occurs, which is momentary and passes off quickly after treatment. Fourth, Existing symptoms can get worse temporarily after treatment. Here comes the conclusion. To maintain normal range of motion, the segments should be moved through their available range periodically, whether it is the available joint range or muscle range. It is recognized that many factors can lead to decreased range of motion, such as systemic, joint, neurological or muscular disease, surgical or traumatic or simply inactivity or immobilization of any region. Therapeutically, mobilization techniques are administered to maintain existing joint and soft tissue mobility, which will minimize the effect of contracture formation. That's all for today. Thank you.